we live like rats in our own country. Yeah, that we have to wake up every day to go and beg people who are not natives for jobs. We wake up every day and we call the real foreigners, we call them boss and we call them sir and we call them boss. We go and ask for loans from them. We, go, we, we buy vehicles, we support their businesses, but we are the natives. You know, we fight to get into their institutions that they build through our exploitation. This is The Hustlers Corner. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to The Hustlers Corner. Beautiful, exciting episode once again. The community is growing. I'd like to welcome all of our brand new subscribers. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you so much. This is an educational platform. So a lot of the people that I'll keep on inviting from time to time, myself and God Panyol, will be um, people that are going to come in, educate us, or just share a conversation that I think we might learn a thing or two from them, just like we've been learning from um, a whole lot of uh, other guests as well. So remember, we drop episodes three times a week. We started doing that just this week. Mm. Monday, 12 o'clock, Wednesday, 12 o'clock, Friday, 12 o'clock. Three episodes a week. It's no longer just Monday and Friday. Monday is just me and Panyo, virtual Mkuku, and then Wednesday, there's a guest, and Friday, there's also a guest. Go to that like button, click that like button on the count of one, two, three, let's go. Click, 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 click click that sharp, 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 sharp sign and then the subscription button as well click thank you so much and don't forget to switch on that notification bell so that it lets you know when there is a brand new video that's just been dropped just like right now i'd like to welcome my brother mr veli wunjan put sharp sharp sweet i'm let me actually yes put yes put Give, give these people a bit of a perspective or context as to what you feel in Oban. Yeah. But here's uh, a brief profile of Mr. Velim Bele Gasompisi, who was born, I won't tell you the year, but he's from Kakoshi Khalishi in Kimberley. He's an Afrocentric essayist, black power proponent, a pan Africanist, and co founder of the Black Power Front and online Afrocentric channel, Mudaba. He's been involved in leadership and activism roles over the years from when he was a teenager. He co-founded and served in community organizations in his community of Khalishewe cultural organizations, Khalishewe tourism awareness groups. While he was in high school at Tirelejo, I think, secondary school, co-founded Gary Vite Radical Movement for the African Youth Movement, and he served as president of the SRC at the same school. He went on to serve as branch and provincial chairperson of the Azanian Students Convention, the Azasco, and he later was deputy president of the SRC at the Central University of Technology, that is CUT, at the um, Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town. At different times, he led the tertiary students and youth wings of Azapo as national president. His intellectual interests and areas of intellectual study include African history of antiquity, African philosophy, international relations, economics, politics, race, identity, education, science, reading, writing. He writes and speaks regularly to young people. He's got his own platform, his own channel. He's also passionate about the development of black boys and has co-founded a project called Black Brothers United. And as a writer, he has contributed chapters to several Afrocentric books and left-wing organizations. These include the book, We Write What We Like. This book is a tribute to Bantubiko by various black consciousness luminaries. Um, Menelik, a left-wing publication based in Torino, Italy. The Lives of Black Folk is a collection of essays by black South African writers, artists, and activists. And then lastly, because I'm not gonna read the entire essay, because his <laughs> achievements are crazy, guys, but his latest chapter appears in the book, Words Flowing Up South, Hope Amidst Hostility by American Afrocentric scholar activist Dr. Jesse Sharp. Some of his published essays and lecture include Pan-Africanism and Quest for Black Power Today, The Fall of Cecil John Rhodes at the Rise of Black Power, Free Education, The Rise to Call Our African Souls, our, our, our souls our own mm. blackness as absence of presence exposing the inherent fa fallacies in the official discourse on racism in south africa and then it goes on and on and on and on and on and on you have been working my brother so it seems yeah 
<laughs> so it seems. I'd understand why you'd bring these. And by the way, Peno, you missed out today. So seeing that you didn't come today, <laughs> you're saying this was for Peno? Yes, uh, the, 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 the Patrice Lumumba biography. That was for my brother, Umlojo. Peno, yeah. So, Peñuel, I'm going to have to read this one first, and then after I've read it, I'll pass it on to you. I'm going to, I'm going to, get, I'm going to get done with it in a day. At most, maybe in a weekend if I'm a bit lazy. Yeah. Patrice Lumumba. Yeah. A Jakana pocket biography, George's Nzongola and Talaja. Yeah. I'm looking forward to diving in on, del delving in on this one. Yeah. And then me, you, you brought me this one. Yeah, so um, I brought you this one uh, by Thomas Sankara. It's a it's, it's on Thomas Sankara, the great Thomas Sankara, who I think is uh, like Patrice Lumumba, two of the greatest black people to ever walk the earth. You know, that's how great they are. And I brought these books for the two of you because uh, I think you are doing very important work to inspire black people to be themselves and to take charge of their destiny. And these books were just my way of appreciating the work and the sacrifices that you are making yourself and Umfawetu, who could not join us, um, you know. So this was really just a gesture to say, you know, yeah, we're very, very humbled. I don't often get gifts. I yeah. give gifts, but it's, it's for me, um, very honorable to just get people agree to yeah. this invite. Yeah. That on its own is a very, it's the biggest gift mm -hmm. because what is in your mind and what you share here is going to live on camera forever. So for me, I kind of feel I've played my role through my, my talents. I'm using these broadcasting um, opportunities or privileges that I have to bring people like yourself to share that information so it lives on the internet forever. Future generations of young black kids yes. will continue to watch these in interviews yeah. long after we're gone. So for me, that's the biggest gift you guys can ever give to us as our guests. Also, also, you know, why, why we have to do that when I'm for it? It's because um, it is important that we lift each other up. You're seeing on Seven's way too. So when I see you trying to make us great as black people, right, I recognize that. And one way of recognizing it is to let you know when you can still smell your flowers. So it's in fair to smooth now I'm lodged. I see what you're trying to do. And we are proud of what you are doing, you know. So yes. that we is well and to sapi. Yes. So for me, that's one of the important things that I think we must consistently do: affirm each other positively as black people. No, I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate that one, Apu And then let me come to these three. These are some of your contributions. So you've contributed in in a lot of books. So these are some of them, yeah. right? Starting with this one. What is this one? So this is um, the lives of black folk. Uh, it's uh, it was a book that was a, a project of a local cultural magazine called Culture Review, right? Okay. By Done by a brother called Kulani who works in the arts. This is the one in the obituary Yamle we found. Strange enough, the name Menelik actually is an Ethiopian name, right? That comes from the Ethiopian, uh, this thing, King, King Menelik, who actually defeated the Italians in the Battle of Adwa. So it is interesting that Italians would name their publication after an African warrior king, King Menelik. So they just call it Menelik, but it's actually Menelik. Mm. It's an Ethiopian name. Yeah, well. And then the last one here on the table. Yeah, and then the last one is uh, Words Flowing Up South, you know. So this is by U Dr. Jesse Sharp. So the interesting thing about this one is that um, this is like, um, you know, an Afrocentric resource of uh, Afrocentric writers from across the African world and he asked me to be one of the contributors. This is incredible, man. Yeah. What, what, what brought you into this um, whole world of black consciousness? What do I, when, I, when I would interview somebody who's on radio, yeah. I would usually say, may so rest in peace the great Bob Mabena. My first question, if you watch uh, that interview, it's actually on the Aslas Corner. The first yeah. question would be, when did the radio bug bite you? Yeah. When, uh, when did you um, <laughs> what is that spark? I remember asking even no put and the was here the last yes, time. Yeah. What is that thing that, that introduced you to black, to black consciousness? And then he started telling us about this African who used to drive into a farm when he was 13 years old. This man would say, Open the gate, and he would open the gate, the gate when the white yeah. man's van is coming. And then he says, Um, this man said, 
yeah he said no thank you or something like that and yeah. it's like yeah v expecting him to say yeah boss, yeah, boss he says yeah. that's when it started it, and then this man chased him he didn't want to say that and he was irritated by the fact that he chased him and then after that there was just that hostility and yeah. then the guy went on to kill some people in his community and the, but then he started rebelling from a young age, age but yeah. that was just that moment when he, he he started going down that route of rebelling and being irritated by Abandaba's Telela, you know, Abandaba. Yes. Abandaba Stundeza, you know. Absolutely, yeah. That, that's what sparked the black consciousness, the fire of black consciousness in uh, Brother Andy Lemgutam. Yes, sir. A beautiful and powerful story. So, in my case, um, the fire was sparked at around, say, age 17, 16, 17. And this is how it started. So, I am uh, a history buff from high school yeah well, so history has been my thing and uh, and in the conversation i hope we are also going to share a bit of important uh historical moments yeah. you know that relate to the month of april so for me <laughs> here am i um so meaning he lazy that went to school yes got to be good more standard this and standard mm. that yeah what well, same here yeah it, it creates I from one from, I from two, one from two yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. so when i was in standard seven i discover something in our history textbooks that the manner in which Africans and African leaders are portrayed in our history textbooks they are always portrayed in a clumsy disrespectful way you know so when you look at the picture and Jane our history textbooks they don't look respectable but when I look at Abo Otto von Bismarck Nabo Napoleon they look very respectable you know so the pictures that and this is one of the things I asked my history teacher about the Gutibar Menier, as we used to call yeah, them. Menier, yes. Or Menier, why uh, our, our leaders, you know, our leaders, the Zulu or Kosa leaders portrayed like this in these books, you know. And the response that I got yeah. from my highly irritated teacher, you know, was that Mbele Sani, do you want to teach my class? Ufunu Zenzu teacher, it class any Mbele Sani. sad, you know. Now, being a respectful young man, I decided not to pursue the matter further with my teacher. But you see, it bothered me at that age as to why are Africans reflected in such a disdainful manner. So in this enzyme, I then got together with a couple of my fellow history students and we decided to go and investigate this thing for ourselves. So we spent a lot of time after that, Kuma Library, around the Kassile to Khalishio. You know, and then some of the things we discovered was that actually there were things like colonialism and racism, and they have to do with how people port are portrayed in history. And that's where the light bulb switch on. Oh, okay. The way history is written, history is also written from the perspective of the conqueror. So the reading that we did helped us understand what my teacher could not explain for us. So decide again, we must form an after school study group. We then called it the Africa Youth Movement. And we decided we are going to research three things religion, politics, and economics. On our own, because we just felt what the teachers were giving us was inadequate. And this is where this whole thing started. Now through that, we then discovered about black consciousness, Pan-Africanism. We then discovered African writers, you know, Abo Nguki Wationgo, Abo Marcus Garvey, uh, Abo Sheikh Anta Diop, Abo Amilka Cabral, Sisase High School. And it's a fascinating world that opens up for us. And we discovered, damn. So this is what our teachers have been depriving us. And we are also shocked to discover that there's also something that is called African civilizations like Abu ancient Egypt Naboma Pungupwe where Africans actually built things and invented things and so she said high school and we are making these discoveries you know and I remember one of the things that was an exciting discovery for us one of the pyramids in what is called Egypt today right is the one, the, the popular one, is the one that has got the body of a human. The lower body is the body of a human, but the, it's, it's actually a lion, sorry. And then it's, uh, the face is that of a human, but the lower body is that of a lion. And it's one of the main pyramids, as I say, Egypt. So we discovered that 
And the story was because the nose of that statue was chipped off. So the story was at the time that when the Europeans invaded what is called Egypt today, this gigantic architectural piece has got the features of an African. And it is said it is Napoleon, I don't know how true that is, instructed his uh, cannon commander to shoot off the facial features and especially the nose. And that's why when you look at that picture now, the dominant picture of that main pyramid, I say Egypt, is that the nose has been damaged. You know, oh, the pyramids of Giza, no? Yes, you know, the main one is actually yeah. in Giza. You yeah. know, the pyramid of Kufo, yeah. it's actually in Giza. So that is some of the things we discovered. And for us, that was the beginning of the journey, you know, for me on the, the path to black consciousness, Pan-Africanism, Afrocentricity, self-discovery, you know, and I've been on that journey. And this is around 1993. You know, 1993. So, and I've been on that journey ever since. And it is that journey that led me to some of the books that you are seeing in front of us. You know, uh, being able to write confidently from a Afrocentric, from a space of blackness, and writing fearlessly, right, without worrying about the uh, other sensibilities, especially of Europeans, going to be offended, right. And that has been the work ever since. And for me, that was the light bulb moment, you know. But when I also think back, there was something that happened in my childhood that sort of shaped my worldview and my radical black consciousness outlook. So, Nisase Indoana, and this is the 80s, late 80s, during the state of the emergency, the president at the time, uh, it's P.W. Board, you know, just before Utitler. And because Tinas Blome main road, the main road is called Tihulana. So it's very easy for uh, Abu Khata and Amasocha to go in and out as they please. So this one time, as a family, we are sleeping. They come into my father's house, wake everybody up. The house is full of lights, full of lights, spotlights from outside and inside. They almost broke down the door. And my father, being a male figure, wanted to challenge them and my mother said hey gosh yeah, because my mother could already see Uguti, what these guys are planning to do and by that time my father opens the, the the door they are already in the house and then they just decide and say on suk terrorist africans so a timer tries to explain to them what terrorists are you looking for they push my timer aside and then they go room for room then they go to the main bedroom now a time alarm they turned into angry time alarm and had a lot of suits, right? And sometimes they even, you know, took more space than each year or late. <laughs> no, for real, you know, had a lot of suits. And they then decide to go through the closet, you know, the CBZ wardrobe gets in. Decide to go through the wardrobe, your time and all late. And as they go through my father's suits, many suits, this white soldier says, but the kafir is yeh. Met so buy a suit. You know? So what kafir are you with so many suits? Nginduana and I hear this, right? But I, I did not understand at that point in time what it meant. I saw my father's reaction to understand what was happening. Yabo. And that memory lived with me because it was for the first time in my life where I saw my father powerless humiliated in his own house by a young white boy. And that memory has never escaped me because I looked up to my father and my father was like Superman invincible. But I saw him in one moment reduced to a boy in his own house. And that moment stuck with me. And it shaped my affinity for radical politics and my radical activism because it is part of my experience and to some extent it is something that sits as a trauma with me that I saw somebody that I love and admire you know being reduced to nothingness so for me that is really you know in a nutshell uh, the the moments that sort of shaped me and put me on this journey student leadership Azapo Azasco 
Yeah, so Nyeskati is a high school. So Mina, I joined Azapong say high school at around 16. Yeah, well. uh, so the high school student wing here Azapo was called Azasim, the Azanian Students Movement. Yeah, well. uh, um, I graduated from the same organization. Yeah, he did. Yeah, now you call it up. So our journey is slightly similar because you also grew up like me in the Azapo structures. So I joined the high school. I joined the Azapo high school. Uh, but this is after we had formed our Africa Youth Movement, you know. So my first engagement with black radical politics in organizational form was first through the Africa Youth Movement that we started, right? And then later joined the Azapo at high school. And then um, through the Azapo then, you know, became SRC president, like you said. And then from there, I uh, had to go to Iteshar, Yabo. So, and then I find myself in an interesting situation. So, I don't go too far. So, I go. At the time, it was called Technicon Free State, you know. And, it was uh, bonafide, right? No? Exactly. Yeah, it was very Afri Forumish. So, it's highly politicized. I pay my play consciousness, and my blood is boiling. And to be honest, I had very little interest in Uguya SKL. My interest was more in how do we organize black people on a national scale for them to fight. Because Mina, in my head, that was the thing. Ibi ringa like Mina Guti. Our priorities that we must fight. And for me, Uguya SKL was just a convenient uh, outlet to go and push Lento. Yabo. And this is also because if I had to just go back. The reason why I ended up at Sirelet, the high school that you referred to in my intro, Ioli Dilam wanted me to go to Kimberley Boys High. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a blazer, and it's a, it's a colonial school, which was called a Model C school. You know, I'm a blazer and become probably head boy, you know, those types of schools. And then, me, you know, I played along with the old lady for a certain period. Sire, and we even wrote an entrance test. I was successful. So I was actually going to do my high school at Kimberley Boys High. But something inside of me did not resonate with the space on a Saturday, Saya Lapo, for your orientation. And then I clandestinely enrolled myself at Sireleto without telling you late in a time alarm. And then what I then did, the old lady already went to buy me the very expensive blazer, the uniform yakon. So what I then did, I sold my blazer and the uniform, yeah, bon. And now collecting you, we are corner. I got you, lady, and gave the old lady the explanation. That I sold everything, yeah. but here is the money. I've already been accepted at Sireleto, so don't stress. Now, the appeal that it's Sireleto had to me is that it's Sireleto was the center of resistance against the apartheid, the Kassinlam. So it had that reputation, Uguti. Magu Kulumang or Sainova, Nomzabalazo, you know, Iskela say to its relates or had that. And that's what attracted me actually to its relates. And I ended up there, yeah, bo. Uh, because for me that was the appeal. I just liked the fact that there was this school that was a bastion of resistance against the white supremacy, Yabo Nekasi, and it offered itself and it produced many brilliant leaders, uh, Zomzabalazo Kasi. So Going to a technical free state, that was my orientation. Uguti, Melis, you organize a band by Gitu, Uguti, see your core. Yeah, bo. It's Kelangs was born in between, but for me, the primary thing was that we must organize and conscientize. That's the word we used. Conscientize black people so that black people can fight for their liberation. So I walk into a technical free state. I notice, you figure out, like many of us, no financial backing, no nothing. I had. About 900 rent. There were internal challenges between the old lady and the timer, and I decided, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, Whether you were in corner, because I told the old lady in the time, I was going to fire. Anyway, I had made up my mind. I was going to fire. I left a Kibeli train from Kimbali to Uyeplom. Very, very short distance. You arrived the same day, not even an hour. Uh, if not, yeah, more than an hour, in fact, yeah, because I'm going to stop. Got there. So, I'm figuring I'm a peg, I'm a fresher, and you notice first time on a campus, yeah, bo, 
you notice, but I already can see you took to Elamanga, you know, and that already captures my attention. And you can see about you know, very tense. This is 1996. Yabo, about Daiki are very tense. You can see the black students are not free. It's as is as the time goes. Then, um, as we are still sitting, manje, waiting to be given a direction by the elder students, Uguti, if you want to register here, go. See, I'm going to go to the mass meeting. Then we go and attend. But as it says, we hear there are problems. See, I'm going to go about financial exclusion, about academic exclusion. The black students are complaining in that meeting. Mm. But one of the things we notice is that but you these guys but traumatized by a sub, you know. And could go in a security campus in the hall. And I don't understand. So this is how people behave at Hesha. You know, they are polite, nice, and Bakuluma, you know, with a lot of fear. Hey, I could not relate. No, I mean I come from a different environment. And I, from the environment, yet here, yes, no good in, and, and throwing stones at Ama Yipo, you know, Nama Kuela Kuela. So, I mean, I have that experience, no good. I come yeah, with that yeah, thing. Yeah. So, Laban Yababo, no good in Oman, they operate at a different level. Sharp. Now, I'm watching this thing, and then I get irritated. Remember, they don't even know me. Uh, and I'm not even a student. I'm not registered yet. So, we are going to ask our student organizations to come forward as those guy input. So, when you, when you join Azapo a high school, it's Azasim. Malfige Teshari is Azasko, the Zanian Students Convention. So, I'm waiting for somebody from Azasko to go up. There's nobody going up. So, somebody has to go there. I then decide, and then I go up. So, I go up there, and uh, so, Kune out from the one student organization called Isasko, the guy speaks. So, I get Kuluma Lapo. He speaks in very apologetic terms, yeah, bo, and uh, talks about the need of us needing to work together. Clearly, we are on campus, there's tension, and the white students are beating up black students almost every day. So this guy comes up and he talks, you know, rainbowish stuff. Yeah, bo, na in in. I'm very impatient. The student wing of the PAC. Then he comes. So he pushes a different line. We must organize and we must resist. We can't accept this. Pushes a line. It's okay, Unka is team. And then I follow as the last one. So when I get there, I tell the students, this is a problem of black students. And I don't know what the white students want in this meeting. So you had a strange situation where the white SRC sits in the meetings of black students. As if, you see that thing that oh brother Andile Mutama spoke about of yeah. Yapas. Mm. Oh, so you watched that interview? Yes. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Mm. So you had this young boy who's a boss who sits yeah. in those meetings. Who was expecting to be glorified. Yeah, and mm. told about. So that's the, and I notice, I mean, I'm reading. Then I decide to go to the first thing in Yenza, before I made my input, Niti. This white boy who's in here must get out. Yeah, this white boy who's in here, yeah, boy, must must get out of this meeting. And if he decides to stay, we can't guarantee his safety. Yeah, boy. Yeah. So go about tense for a couple of seconds. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we understand. Exactly. Yeah. So there was a moment where everybody froze and wanted to see Uguchi Guzo Wenzagalan. Yeah, boy. Is also or what's going to happen? And then, tense as it was, Lendwana Yengamla then decides to take it under a chair, okay, SR Singama Blazer, to get out. And the hall erupted. So that was our year, 196. Fighting, fighting, very little studying, to be honest. Fighting, 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 fighting. 
And then it became clear also that we became persona non grata on campus, that a lot of other things could happen to us because there was a group called the Technicon Student Bond, which was specializing in physically panel beating black students after hours. And uh, they almost killed one black fellow. And we then had to arrange Ugutis Pumeres, Ngayo Plomekas, for security reasons. Bangjelu Ugutis, my comrade Ugutis, Uzo Kawateka, Ngayo Plomekas. I had to go and rent the back room, Epameng, Yabo, for safety reasons. Near campus, in. sometimes I had to wear these guys. Uh, in and out of the campus because I was one of those people who was wanted. Now, it was clear that I was not going to succeed Kuleso Skela. By the time yet that then, my old lady got some phone call or a letter directly from the rector's office. Uguti, your son must not come back to school next year. I then had to make an arrangement to move to another campus. Yabo. Uh, I then ended up at Cape Town, yeah, well, at Pentec, which is now called CPUT. Yeah, well. So in Figalap, a totally different environment. Uh, politically, atmosphere was not like that because it was an all-black campus. Yeah, well. So I still pushed my student activism in Alapo, but obviously the environment was different. So there was no need for any physical confrontation with uh, white students, you know, as it were in Aleso Skati. Yeah, so in Skati, we were fighting at uh, Free State Technicon. The Pretoria Technicon, where TUT is now main campus, was also on fire. Those were the two campuses in 1996 where black students were physically fighting with uh, white students because white students were organizing themselves because many of them had parents who were farmers and what what and they organized themselves because they played the hockey and they came on campus and then they would trap black students a Pretoria Technicon na say free state and that's the environment you know mina engi like my tertiary introduction to Abu Fumba first year that was my environment and uh, it, it shaped me, yeah, well, uh, and it, I got involved, SRC, you know, deputy president, uh, and then also through my activism served as national president for all the campuses across the country of the Azapo structures, Azasco, you know, so became national president. Uh, you know, and so that was part and parcel of my student activism in a nutshell. Wow, what an interesting student's journey. And a lot of us actually, these things start from being a student from yeah. campus. Yeah, like, yeah. Skela, I it's a, by, actually, I started hustling on campus. I remember, so yeah. I, always tell, I, tell, I tell that story quite a lot. You yeah. Know? So if you are on campus, guys, and you haven't started anything, for the, the ones who are students, yeah. you must be worried. Because whatever you're going <laughs> to be in the future starts now. Absolutely. Because yeah. sometimes it doesn't, you don't actually graduate and finish what you're doing to go oh, and become yeah. that. Well, that's what, that was my case. Yeah. Where I never became an engineer in practice, right? Yeah. Electrical engineer. I mean, I'm doing this now, yeah. you know? But then uh, there was the PAC. There sure. was Azapo. Sure. And then there was the ANC. Sure. The other day, no, put Andy Lemkobitama. There were very yeah. interesting conversations here where he was even unpacking. But no, the ANC that you know now, at some point, ANC was not accepting um, white mm. members. It was PAC that was strictly black, yeah. ANC that was strictly black. Yeah. And what I would like to know for Mina is the ideologies, especially back then, and how did Azapo differ from the PAC's ideologies and the ANC? Yeah, so, and it, it's an interesting thing. Um, so, I Azapo draws its genesis from Ustif Miko, you know, so, and incidentally, uh, this month, it's the commemoration of the founding of both Azapo and the PAC, April. Oh, wow. They, yes. were, they were founded in April, the PAC in 1959, uh, Orlando, Aluta, Aluta, Aluta. So it's an important moment. The struggle continues. Yeah, and Azapo in 1978, uh, also in April. So this month, it also commemorates those two anniversaries. So Azapo draws its inspiration from Steve Biko, right? Yeah. The black consciousness uh, philosophy and stuff. Now, uh, to understand it, it's also important to read Steve Miko himself, 
right, as the overall leader and founder of the Black Consciousness Movement. It's also important to understand his thinking as it relates to the PAC and the ANC, which were the older liberation movement. So if you, if you look at Steve Biko's writings, the student, Steve Biko, the student leader, uh, they had studied both the documents of the PAC and the ANC, right? And having studied those documents, they then made their own determination. Uh, and part of their determination was also drawn from their wide research because they were also influenced by the thinking of people like Franz Fanon, but also the black power movement in the US had a big influence also on the thinking of the black consciousness movement about Steve Biko. So they drew a lot from the black power movement. Even Umkulo Ganina Simone, right, young, gifted, and black, was an integral part of uh, the, the culture within the black consciousness movement about Steve Biko. So for them, they were more drawn to the radical outlook of blackness and asserting your blackness, right? But also the other distinguishing factor with them was that their thinking was that there was no value in negotiating with the system of whiteness or even with white people and that black people had to organize themselves exclusively as a racially distinct group you know so that was really their orientation and this is why uh, one of their policies when they were founded as the black conscious movement is also they had a policy position that stated that membership shall be open to black people only. It was a policy position. Membership shall be open to black people only. So what distinguishes them, for instance, from organizations like the ANC, they did not believe in a multiracial approach. You know, they believed that black people were more than capable of leading their own struggle. But where it actually comes from, and this is the interesting thing, the founding leaders of the ANC Youth League, Ubabu Anton Lempete, Muziwake, Nobabu Apimta, are actually in historical sequence, right? Um, the people who sort of like planted the seeds for radical black consciousness and radical pan Africanism. That's and if you go and study the founding policies of the ANC Youth League, you know. They are some of the most advanced and the most radical, the most black conscious documents. So Abu Steve Biko, in my view, are sort of uh, a continuation of the radical tradition. In a distinct organization which is called the Black Consciousness Movement. So he as Apo then draws from that heritage of black consciousness about Steve Biko as a continuation, you know. And it, it then bases itself on black consciousness, the concepts of black power, black pride, and most importantly, black people leading their own struggle and not believing Guilona, we multiracialism. But it's also important to state that the black consciousness movement and Azapo had a very healthy respect for the leaders of the ANC and the PAC, even though they did not think they must join Abu Steve Biko, they must join the ANC and the PAC, they had a very healthy respect for them. For instance, a young Steve Biko in 1976, December 1976, a young Steve Biko, the US Senator Dick Clark visits South Africa. A young Steve Biko picks up that Dick Clark is in South Africa. Steve Biko writes a letter which letter says the United States must put pressure on the apartheid regime to call for the release of the leaders of black people and he mentions Ubaba U Nelson Mandela, Ubaba U Mangaliso Sobukwe, da 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 others and he does not just mention leaders of the black consciousness movement he does that he's in his 20s and he engages in international relations with another government on behalf of black people, a 20 something year old. Here's another important thing the arrangements for the funeral service, the leadership here as a played a big role. 
in the arrangement of the funeral service in 1978. You know? So the point that I'm making is that even though Abo, Abo, Abo Steve Biko, right, and the subsequent generation that formed the Azapo decided to form their own distinct organization, their attitude towards organizations like the ANC and the PAC was that of respect. And unfortunately, it was not always reciprocated, especially from the ANC side, because there was one unfortunate thing that happened in the history of, especially as upon ANC, where there was a rumor that was circulated by ANC people that do Steve Biko is a CIA agent, right? And that fueled a bloody conflict between members of Azapo and the ANC. At the time, they were using the, 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 the this thing, the cloak of the UDF, you know. So, and people died as a result of that type of um, messaging and, uh, um, uh, you know, misleading of people, you know. So people died as a result of that. So you had that. And you also had, I mean, especially Maubuya, I still struggle to say Ekurulen. If you are from the East Rand, so I, mean, I, I talk of the East Rand, yeah. you would remember there was also this conflict uh, at Togo's uh, Masikatle Masikatle Hong. Masikatle Hong. Yeah, but there was, was still an yeah, that was the IFP and, and the, the IFP. And, 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 but there was also this one that was directed. The tribalistic, the Zulu, yeah, the Rikosas. There was also this one that was directed at the PAC specifically. You understand? So, they also suffered and let's see, it was all necklacing. You know, Makasi, and then you had black people burning each other. You know, burning each other as uh, sellouts, you know. In PMP. In PMP. Mm. And in a number of cases, innocent black people were killed. Yeah, uh, and this is why it worried me when I saw a, a, a reenactment of that with Elvis Nyati a, a deep slot recently because I'm one of those who know that history and I know how we have used violence against each other as black people you know uh, and so when I saw that it took me back to that you know so that is really how if I want to just distinguish you know to your question about you know the thinking here as up and how it distinguished itself uh, from um, organizations like our PAC NABO but also Remember, Azapo also adopted certain things that were pioneered by the PAC, like the concept of the name Azania, right? It is the PAC that, um, you know, popularized and uh, institutionalized the name Azania. So Abo Azapo and the Black Consciousness Movement adopted it, you know. And again, it, it tries, I'm trying to make the point about the attitude that Ama organizations like Abo Azapo had, you know, that they did not look at PAC or ANC as part of the enemy camp. You know, they looked at them as part and parcel of the camp here, black liberation uh, struggle. The politics of today, your opinion on what's going on in the country currently? Um, maybe let's start by saying we are in trouble as black people in this country, right? And I say as black people because it is also important for us to always remind ourselves we are the natives and this country belongs to us and nobody else. That's always my point of departure. You know, so there's no co-management, there's no co-ownership. This country belongs to black people and black people alone and so does the whole of Africa. I have no illusions about it or any apology about it. And so if you look at where we are as the natives, the people who are supposed to own and control things in this European colony called South Africa, right? We live like rats in our own country. Yeah, right? We have to wake up every day to go and beg people who are not natives for jobs. We wake up every day and we call the real foreigners, we call them boss, and we call them sir, and we call them boss. We go and ask for loans from them. We, go, we, we buy vehicles, we support their businesses, but we are the natives. You know, we fight to get into their institutions that they build through our exploitation. You know, we have absolutely no institutions that we can call our own. 
We control the talk shop called parliament. You know, over and above that, what other important institution do we control? You know, so, but then you also see, and to just crystallize the point I'm making, in March this year, the World Bank published a report on poverty inequality in South Africa. Yeah. And the World Bank states, this is March the 9th this year. Kusho E World Bank. E World Bank says over 80% of the financial assets in South Africa are in the hands of less than 10% of the population that constitutes the minority in this country. So that's over 80 percent of the fin main financial assets yeah. of South Africa yeah. are in the hands of less than 10 percent of the population. That is in 2022. That's what the World Bank says. Now, because this is the month of freedom in this country, the question that that report forces people like me and you to ask is, what freedom are we celebrating? I tweeted the same thing on Do you Freedom understand? Day in the morning. I was like, are we, are we even free? Yeah, what freedom are we celebrating? So, the people who are saying, or, or, or the people who are celebrating freedom, Abbas Chele, what freedom are we celebrating? In a context where 80% of the financial assets of our country are owned by foreigners. But if I'm a white person, I easily say, you guys are black and you're in power. Why don't you change it? What power? That's the question I always ask. What power? Because is parliament power? You've got political power. But do you have political will? <laughs> I see political will. The administration of the state, right, is confused with political power. What black people are in charge of, you have ministers, you have MECs, you have what, mayors. That's the administration of the state, right? Now, if you want to change things in this country, right, you need to control more than just the administration of the state. And that's the means of production, the means of creating livelihood. We don't control that. So we make the laws, for instance, EPE is a law that was made by a black parliament. But that black parliament does not have the capacity to enforce it because they can't tell the white corporates what to do because they have to beg them. Now, it makes you question what political power has to beg, right, the ones who have the economy. And, and what, what is power about that political power? Because if it can't translate into us for instance, owning land and property freely, of what value is it? Because when people say we've got political power, you know, in tangible terms, what does it mean? Does it just mean the capacity to write laws? You know, so for me, a power, just like uh, when you look at the freedom, a power is when you have the capacity to change your reality. But we do have that power. Why don't we change it? You understand? So, I, I, because you see, it also has to do with do we have the mental orientation to do that? I think we don't have. And one of our biggest problems, like Ubabu Hatebe said, a case at end, Sisababelu, I also think we should not burden the ANC with something that they are not designed for, which is repossessing our land. If you study throughout the history of the ANC, right, repossessing land and giving it to black people was never central to the existence of the ANC. The South African National Natives Congress, right, which later becomes the ANC, how do they respond to that? They send a delegation to England to go and complain that the union was constituted without their involvement or their consultation. To go and complain, they, they made what was called deputations, right, to the British crown, to say that they were not involved and they were not, And if you go and read the text of their actual deputation, they refer to themselves as the loyal subjects of His Majesty. Right. So I argue that if you study the, the, the orientation and the history of the ANC throughout, the issue of land 
and it being repossessed and being given to black people does not appear as a central feature of their existence. And because if you look at their politics throughout, their politics have always been about either being integrated into the structures that the colonials have created or coexistence with them. That, that is my reading of that history, you know. And the reason why the PAC was formed, in fact, this was the central issue. Because central to the formation of the PAC is the adoption of the Freedom Charter, and in particular the clause that says South Africa belongs to all who live in it. But all who live in it is not only just black people, Do right? you understand? Mm. That was the crux of the issue because before 1955, the policy manifesto of the ANC Youth League said the land belongs to Africans and Africans alone. So the people who went to form the PAC came from that school of thought, the people who were called the Africanist, because they did not agree with the view that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Because they know Europe belongs to Europeans, you know. And then, and this is why there's a slogan in the PAC, from Cape to Cairo, from Morocco to Madagascar, the Africa is related. Mm. That's where it comes from. How do we get out of all this mess that we're in as black people? Um, first, I think we must acknowledge that it's a very complex situation, you know, uh, because part of it also has to do with the fact that many black people don't see it for what it is. That's the level of complexity according. Because there are black people who genuinely believe we are free. And they are convinced, Bangalwa now, they will actually make you believe there's something wrong with you who questions uh, the, 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 the validity of the notion of freedom, you know. So that's the one of the levels of e complexity. And I do think, for me, one of the ways of getting us out of this, right, um, it, the central to it has to do with what do we think about ourselves as black people. Let's remove other groups out of the equation for a moment. If we as black people do not understand and believe that we are deserving of dignity and that it's not natural, it's not natural to wake up and go and ask for work. It's not natural to be an unemployed graduate. You know, so until we reach a stage where we understand that our material powerlessness is not a natural phenomenon, it is man-made and it's something we must not accept, right? I think that would be a step towards us attaining and reclaiming our dignity and our humanity because as things stand now, many of us as black people still have the thinking that suggests that, you know, if we just work a bit harder, you know, our problem is laziness. It's not so much racism and apartheid. And you are living in the past. There are people who argue like that. Would you look, you are living in the past. It's not racism. It's just laziness. And the problem is corruption. If you can just deal with corruption and get the governance issues right. You know, history has shown that that is one of the biggest tricks that has been played on black people and black countries to make you believe that just work a little bit harder, get your governance systems right and democratize here and there, and voila, you will have a fundamental change in your materials. It has never worked anywhere. In fact, it has always been a strategy to manage the anger of black people and give them false hope, but also to entrench the mindset of celebrating one black person every 10 years who has made it to the master's table. And then that is measured as progress. But we don't look at where the group is. So we uphold these individuals. He's the first black CEO. of, the, And there's a lot of media attention on this one individual. And that image dominates uh, the minds of young black people. And everybody strives to be like this one guy or this one lady. You know, And they get us focusing on that. You know, I mean, like, I was telling somebody and... A lot of people disagreed with me, and I don't think they understood the point I was making. When our brother Usia Kolisi was made captain of the Springboks, so I wrote an essay, and I knew I was going to get this backlash, that 
I don't understand why we think it's something we must celebrate. That was my view. You know, that I don't understand why we think it's something we must celebrate. And the argument I was making was that the co-option or the inclusion of black people in white created structures can't be progress for the rest of the group. Because the big issue here is not whether or not Sia Colisi deserves it or whether he is talented. I was not questioning that. What I was questioning was the trick that continues to be played uh, on us as black people where one or two black people get promoted to sit at the master's table and we get massaged by the media to celebrate that as progress and that we are making progress as a group. You know? So when the material circumstances of Abanbagi, Tabatlala, Go, Oliven, Go, Alexander, Go, Kylie, Chagom, Tanzani, you know, until there is a material shift in the circumstances of those people, material shift, people stay in houses, not things that are examples of what a house should not be. Houses, proper houses, where there's proper space for you and your wife to talk away from the children and have privacy. Not a one room, you know, which is a glorified pigsty, and then we call it a house. Where your children don't have privacy, you don't have privacy. Where your children can't even go and play in the street because of no space, we are living on top of each other. So until those circumstances change for the majority of black people in our country, right, celebrating me or you as an individual would have greater meaning if it is reflective of the condition in majority. Because they keep us in this trick of celebrating individuals. Because I see it even overseas, right? I was going to talk actually about the trick they played on us with Obama, right? They, it was the same, it was the same trick. The thing they did with Kamala Harris, the current deputy president of the US, you know, to also get, to, to as part of anger management on the part of black people, and also as part of giving black people false hope that if she can make it, you know. So you, you know this, um, this mind numbing motivational crap, you know, if you can conceive it, you can achieve it, you know where they feed you those things. And they don't tell you, Guti, there are structures that are designed to make sure that black people don't make it. You know, whether it's in the corporate, whether it's in academia. That, that, they, that's, that's what we call real racism. Yeah, there, that's they, real racism. There, there are white cabals mm. in universities, in the corporates, in sports that sit before formal meetings and decide what the outcome of a meeting is going to be even if the CEO of that meeting or the chair is a black person, you know. So there are black people who don't understand that this is how that the system works. That the white people that we see achieving are products of secret plotting and behind the scenes plotting that white people do. So Tina went... And, and some black brothers and sisters who get put in those positions. In those positions. Right? Because, Bona, they get included on the basis to come and manage us. As you are saying, I understand. But so those manager, Bona. You understand? So one of the things, for instance, let's be practical. Tina, and also this usually offends about Mang Ringangai. While Tina, we spend our time and money conquering. Yabo? Bona, what do they do? They go to their farms. They go to their guest houses. It's a long weekend now, right? How are we going to spend the long weekend? What, Tina? So this is taggy. Mm. We understand. <laughs> so all I'm saying is that... We'll be conquering, as you say. We'll be conquering. <laughs> so the point in is that the mainstream politics are a country, right? And I say all political parties, I'm not just saying the ANC, all of them, are stre the, the manner in which they are operating, they are strengthening the muscle of the system of white supremacy. I'll give you an example. Ne? What stops all the black political parties, as we have them now, right, to organize black people in the way that Afri Forum is organizing white people? All as one. Do you understand? We are all different yeah. political parties 
just just like at the Berlin conference where they when yes. they made that decision to chop up Africa. Keke. Nati as we are as political yes. parties, we're still divided. Exactly. Like, can't we have just one yeah. one big movement? It, no. Where black people come together, it doesn't matter whatever political party. Exactly. So that is part of the mindset again, for our for our political parties, the black ones that exist, right? When you li when you listen to them and you speak to them, their logos and party symbols and their individual names seem to be more important than the unity of black people. And you see, even when they speak to each other, you know, there is you see the reluctance that there is no conscious effort to get us to be under one black umbrella. And I've made this point where I'm one of those who was calling for a united uh, black front. You know, I think, and I'm saying one of the things we need in this country is a united black front. And Abaya Bengbuza, what do you mean? Get, you know, I don't say the political parties we have, ANC, PAC, EFF, Azapo must dissolve. I'm just saying we must create a vehicle that unites black people. That unites on the fundamental issues. Mm. You understand? The main important The main issues. issues. Mm. As things stand now, ne, a lot of black people are doing brilliant individual work in the arts, in business. They are starting their own things, building their own organizations, building their own brands. You are one of them, right? But you see, your work, my work, and the work of other black people, we don't have a central vehicle that mobilizes us, that organizes us nationally, so that we maximize our potential, bring our resources together, you know. So you are busy having to find out what the regulations are in your industry, you know, what the barriers are, what's the capital that's needed to enter. There's another black person who's doing this very same donkey work you're doing. There's another one in another industry. Here. Whereas if you had a national movement and organization, that brings all of those experiences and expertise together. You know, you would have a greater impact, you know. And for me, I think unless we are able to do that, you know, many of the people who are doing individual brilliant and developmental things are still going to struggle because they are fighting against a system that is far more organized than them. And this is our weakness. Yeah, but Uguti, uh, blacks in business, blacks in the arts, blacks in politics, blacks in academia, blacks in the NGO sector, blacks in agriculture, da da da. We don't have a central movement or vehicle that can help us look at our things. You know, and understand what this is our backyard, actually. People should be hearing from us and not the other way around, you know. So I don't think we have reached that level of consciousness. And part of the work that we are doing. Uh, through Mutapa and the other movements we work with, Black Power Front, the other movement that we belong to, Nabo, Ubaba Lobesi in Vaitile, Mina Nawe, Cape Town, Ubabu Hateb. Oh, incredible work you know, Ubabu Hateb. Yes. Ubabu Hateb is working in the space of spirituality, you know. Yeah. And I got a chance to meet um, one of my role models, Ubab, um, 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 Professor Lumumba. Well, Lumumba, I remember, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Um, um, yeah. 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 It was, it, yeah. was, it was a beautiful experience. It was a beautiful experience. Yeah. 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 So, he is one of the people that is Sebenz and I, Ubabu Hatebe. Ubabu Umamu Noku Zolam Dende as well. And what we are trying to build is a this national movement of vehicle I'm talking about, right? Where we get black people who sit at the, sa at, at the same table, coming from different industries, if you like, or areas of activity. But they are saying, how do we elevate this race called Africans to operate at a higher level, where they have their own land, their own money, our own banks? You know, we should not be shy and afraid to understand that we need to own our own insurance companies, our own banks, our own, um, this thing. Uh, Manufactur ma manufacturing, manufacturing plants. Do you understand? All of those things, I mean, the most simplest of things, we must be able to get a black person producing that. And for me, that is the thing that we should be striving for. And Ispaning is Chuna Yomina, with other people that I work, is geared towards at least cultivating the mindset towards that, but also a lot of the work that we do 
eh, Mutapa, Black Power Front, Ebu Koseni, African Hidden Voices, eh, Ikamaku Institute, Lega Mamuno Kuzolam Tende, eh, Africology Institute, eh, Dr. Ngiti. The work that. Oh, Ebu Koseni, about Dr. Baba Baba Buntu. Yeah. Oh, we heard him yeah. the other day. Yeah. 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 So the work that we are doing is geared towards us building bridges, mm. building synergies, you know, and trying to create this one table where we meet on the basis of blackness. Mm. You know, not uh, you belong to this and ethnic group or this political party, you know. So you're saying like for example the podcast. Yeah. But see in Manjela Banda Babaza Lapagusbuda, are they saying good gush gush good good useless for being good vote any political party mailing in the if you try to good value we are doomed. Uh, it's a layman in the street. Yeah, in the Balegile, Masse Ushangana, Eto Shangana, out, and Shambi out, see Egbona, like you. It's a Buddha Nibonego, a podcast, Gasha Gasha, Yeni Leniza, we achieve it. I think the conversation that we should be having, no Muntum Chalo, and you see, the one thing we must also not do, Tina, who think we are trying to push something. As yega ukpa tula bantu bageti mental, ukpunuk shaya shaya bantu, yabo, and want to tell people things because we want people to think we are intelligent or we are smart or we have all the answers. That is part of the problem. We must be prepared to make people see the reality for what it is, so that nomfe tu olalelele podcast oshele konen. We must make him understand uguti. Unless yenu ya sugu magule lo kona leyo, aspani usumkondo wake, aspani na banta bakabanga ngalenje la kabanga ngayo, and also puts in the work ayikindwezo change. Okay, so nge, yeah, yeah. So, so I mustn't look at it from Kanjalo, yeah. from that level. I must look at it from my own la ukona. small space. We na la ukona. And, mm. yeah. Like and, what you guys are doing in yes, space. Yeah, mm. and understand uguti, there is something you can contribute. And but also let's understand what are the things that you are passionate about. So that Uma Sishangana now, sitting fetu as his pani, sing ak fagi we into tolu gutim shambi aks into nanyai. Yabo, because that's the other mistake we make. Yabo. So fanana lendo yo kaya banda ma t shirt. You know? But you don't do the the hard work of empowering people with the mindset you male fishing on their own it's like do you the, understand it's, it's like the system of grants yeah I mean I'm one of those people who are, who are opposed against yeah. the system of yeah. grants well maybe because of the top person I'm, I'm a hustler sure. I believe in doing things for self sure, sure, sure. I don't one of the reasons actually why I even started Mofa was very very hectic in philanthropic work a lot of people know I mean I've been visiting schools my entire career, I've been over yeah. almost a thousand schools, 900 and something yeah. schools, doing amazing work through a, 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 a non-profit organization, it's left. Actually, but I started feeling like... Do you, do you know the first time Slang and I, we were doing student work, Minana? Are you serious? Yeah, so <laughs> when I'm Slang, we come out with the first time Slang and I Cape Town. Yeah. yeah. That was the second time. First time Slang and I, Minana, you yeah. were the MC or program director, ne, as you call it. Yeah. Sister Rosebank Mall, right? Yeah. And we were doing oh, at a students um, program, yeah, math and science, yes. yeah, math and science. I remember. So me na being your ring alap with the students. Oh yes, and when and when you introduced me, oh uh, yes, I was saluting every time when you're in front of a public. Platform. We understand. Oh, that was you. Now I can. So that was the first time. <laughs> I remember. So, yes. so the Cape Town Decolonization Conference was our second meeting. Oh, that is so beautiful, Wana Pudveli, because. For me, I look at it like, for people like me who are, or even yourself, sure. who do passionately that type yeah. of work, not even asking for a single sure. cent. I've done it my entire career. Sure. But I came to a point where I, I felt, I'm and I've been doing this work for almost 15 years now. Sure. Hey, help these students. Hey, please pay for these students' yeah. bursaries. Hey, I started becoming, and you, and you feel it when people start seeing you like you're a glorified beggar, yeah. you know? So I kind of felt, how do I come up with something 
that become self-sustainable. Yeah, so that is going to educate these kids. That's going to generate some money. That's going to give some sort of a mindset to into an Echelekonen, a simple person of Echelekonen. But also, but also where you, you know? have control of your vision. Yes, sir. Because that's yes, the sir. important thing. So when Umundo ma eight years, mm. so one of the realizations you made was that it's important for you to also have the material means to control your ideas because umuntu kai nyugo may also decide what happens to your idea exactly yeah he who pays the bill calls the shots yeah. right they decide like like what thomas ankara says here what thomas ankara puts it in a similar way uti he who feeds you controls you and that's true yeah <laughs> and for me now that's that's how I, I started evolving into business i was like you know what let me go into business but let me go do business that involves the ordinary yeah, person yeah, in totally, the streets yeah. But at the same time, it becomes a win-win because if they win, I win. Your model, they, your model they, yeah. Thank you. I love I your mean, model. You know that model. I love right? your model, yeah. And a lot of people have been using that model. Okay, I mean, a, a wrong example I would use is people who would sell drugs. That's my corner. That's my block. That's your block. There's a supply who apply. I mean, that's my system with Mofire. Yeah. There's cash and carries that get supplied. People go pick it up from there. They go and they, they run their own turf. They've got their own territory. Others sell. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there is just this network. Of people that sell more fine street cars. That's why you'd mostly, and it survives still today in my business because of Bona Labo Band Labo that I was yeah. targeting to. I think Semakonin, you'll walk into some of these amazing stores and sure. you probably won't find it, but you'll you'll find it in every or any other township in the street corners. It's saying Semakonin because that's the gospel I have been and preaching. And they identify with it. So that's what I decided to do instead yeah. of just continuously yeah, begging and 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 I'll do it for you, begging with and I'll do begging it. Bowl. So, as much as I'm not in politics, I'm not a politician, I'm not one of the most educated people, but contributions like... A according to you, yeah. <laughs> when Accor I'm according to you, but actually, uh, you, you may not think, uh, and I want this on the record, that you are, you may not think you are in politics and you may not think you are not the most educated, probably by colonial standards. You are probably not the most, by colonial standards. But by the standards of Afro, authentic Afrocentric thinking, right, in my book, you are very advanced, you know, to be certified by a colonial university because what you are doing with the work that you are doing is that you are helping or nudging Africans to understand that there is value in the originality of their own ideas. And they don't need to be certified by any colonial institution for those ideas to be valuable. So, if you or anybody judges themselves by the standards of colonial institutions, you may come to the conclusion that you are not the most educated, and when in fact you are an institution. In my view, you understand, mm. you are an institution. So my point is, it depends whose standards you are judging yourselves with. Are you judging yourself as an African now? Because I'm telling you, Africa poco, you know, Africa poco. So, are you judging yourself by the standards of the people who think we as Africans are naturally inferior and of lower intellect, or are you judging yourselves by the standards of your great ancestors, Bomakado, Abos Kukuni? Um, you know, who thought we were so valuable that we should not just surrender to the colonialists? So by which standards? So by those standards... Uh, yeah, I mean, and that is such an interesting thing. Yeah. Let's go there. Let's yeah. go there. What do we do? Because we promote our young people getting educated. Yes. I want my child to be educated, <laughs> but I also play my role as sure. a father in my own yeah. space outside of sure. Iskela. Sure. But as much as we are advocating for our kids to get these degrees, sure. they're getting educated in whose institutions sure. and how. But then what do we do? Where do we draw the line? How do we get them to be educated and acquire all those amazing degrees and that awesome education, but still advocating for our Africanness? Yeah. How do we do both? Okay, we don't have a choice. Or how do we do it right? Yeah, Maybe that's a so we don't have a choice, yeah. at least Mina now. <laughs> we don't have a choice on whether or not we are Africans or blacks. We are. We don't have a choice. It's not debatable. It's not negotiable. It may be in our colonized minds, you know what? But outside our colonized minds, me and you, our Africanness, our blackness is clear. Our our Nubianness, 
It's, it's, it's not debatable. It just depends what our mindset is. So we don't have to choose to raise our children as Africans or not. Our children are Africans. It's not a matter of choice. Yeah, well, like products in a shelf. Do you want to drink this? It's not like that when it comes to who we are. We are who we are. And Yegi Shinshe. That's one. Two, the organizations I've mentioned, Ebkosini, Ekamako Institute, Institute for Africology, our own organization, Imutapa. We run weekly and monthly Afrocentric education sessions. For instance, today, in Go 6, we will be hosting a brilliant African teacher and scholar, Usis Napo Mashian. You know, we'll be hosting her today at 6 on the Mutapa platform. She would be talking on the meaning of Umama Uzanyiwe Matikizela Mandela. Remember, she passed on four years ago in April. Now, May I so rest in peace. Yeah. You know, yeah. Know. yeah. So, the reason why we started this program, yeah, Afrocentric Education, was that our initial vision actually was to start our own Afrocentric school where our own children will go and they learn about us, our history and our world so that we stop this tragedy of us paying these huge exorbitant fees, right, to take our children to schools that we know socialize them into a culture that is not ours. We know that. So we have taken the step to start small projects that specialize in Afrocentric education. The long-term vision is for us to build Afrocentric schools, and we believe we are capable of doing it. So these books, uh, the ones at the bottom especially, yeah. right? The Lives of Black Folk, Culture yeah. Review. And this one in Melanique, particular. And this and one, yeah. Words yeah. Flowing yeah. Up South, Hope Amidst Hostility. Yeah. These books are products of the work that we are doing. And they serve as the material that we use when people say to us, hey, some piece, you know, I need something to introduce my children to African history. They want to know African. So we are developing the material. But we have a lot of work that we are also producing locally. So there is movement that is happening in that space, you know. So the next step, there are people who are discussing, you know, there are many Afrocentric schools. We actually had a discussion with uh, some of our partners in the US about setting up Afrocentric schools in South Africa. So we got the curriculum, we even got the models, you know as to how it can be done and the governance structures, etc. So there is work that is being done in that space, you know, and it is some of this contribution that some of us are making. So you are making a contribution, for instance, from the perspective of black social innovation and entrepreneurship. That, those are the worlds that I see you bringing together. You are not just a typical textbook entrepreneur but you also fuse your entrepreneurship with social innovation right which means you see your products also as making a contribution to the development of amakasilas pumakon so it's not just about i want to make money out of this particular community but your vision from what i'm seeing is that you also want these communities to believe in themselves especially e youth if Usbu can translate his idea, remember Imofire was an idea that was in your head. Now you've done something very potent. You've translated your idea into reality, something tangible that people can see and touch. Now for me, that's your contribution. Yeah, I understand. Now, if you are able to do that and we multiply the work that you do, Nabanyabantu who do that work, there's, there's, there's something that our generation can contribute to the whole work that was started by Abo Steve Biko, mm. Thomas Sankara, Abo uh, Mamuini, you know, because we should see our work as an, a continuation. It's, we are simply making a contribution. Hustlers and squatters, and yeah, I call you guys squatters because we're part of that virtual mkuku that we're building, yeah. and we're on the Hustlers Corner podcast, which is for hustlers. So hustlers and squatters out there, by the way, I'm also a chiller, because sure. I give the uh, podcast and chill podcast um, 100 rands every month. So I'm actually a premium chiller, which means I, I support 
what our other young black brothers yeah. and sisters are doing, which is incredible. We need to be speaking with organizations like these and partnering with them and finding a way on how do we then merge our communities Absolutely. somehow to um, together, as you're saying, with, this thing needs all of us to just be one Absolutely. voice. Because the other day, I didn't even know me to talk to Baba Buntu knows you. Yeah. Um, but just the fact that you mentioned Ebukosini Solutions, yeah. I picked it up because I know that's his organization. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, so these people know each other. They're working together. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think me and Anopenyol and the team, we also need to come and start supporting or seeing yeah. or finding out what you guys do and then sitting down and finding yeah. a way on how we can also use this platform because at least this, this platform is also growing. Yeah, it's some sort cool. of a voice out there to speak to. And there's a lot of people out there who are willing to assist. I mean, we're getting chartered accountants that are saying, hey, we are here with our skills. What do you want us to do? Yeah. We're getting lawyers. We're getting, there's so many people. When you read comments from every episode that we release, there's a, there, there's a need from a lot of black professionals, just black Ooh, young yeah. people, just a lot of black people who want to give off of themselves to contribute and assist. So I think the first thing that we will do is visit you guys yeah or maybe just watch also wh where are your platforms and yeah. which plus social media platforms you guys exist yeah so the platforms are like the organizations have called so the platforms are mutapa you know so that's one of the social media platforms or mutapa just, mutapa so you just click mutapa and then it's over like okay. it will give you you click mutapa you can also alternatively click arise black child you know abc so arise black child is one of the innovative brilliant movements you know that was started by a brilliant young brother um, who unfortunately left us in january oh. brilliant yeah mr msibi rest in peace rest in peace Sandi, San, San, we will talk about sandy msibi and the work and the body of work that he built through the organization arise, arise black child Brilliant work. Out here, Setsagane lit the fire and inspired hundreds of other young black people and does multiple things businesses, beauty pageants. They are writing, they are producing. Ben's my lecture, you know, and they are all in their 20s. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, rise, black child. So it's one of the organizations we work with, Obukosini, of course, you know. So what we do is that if you see Obukosini's work, or you see Mutapa, or you see Arise Black Child, or you see Ikamako Institute, Kamamunoguzol, or you see the Africology Institute, yes, a case We are involved in their work. You know, we're supporting, if we are not part of the core team that's organizing or presenting or facilitating, we are involved, you know, promoting the work because Kunama platforms where we meet. Uh, we have about two or three WhatsApp groups where all our organizations meet and they talk and say, hey man, who can write? I need somebody who can write, who can research, who can present, who can facilitate, who can organize, who can design plans, right, for setting up our organizations, uh, who is good at product design, who's good at graphic design. So that's the community we have built, you know, and everybody looks at that as their contribution to elevating, you know, the black race to be a race that's self-sufficient, proud, and we stop becoming synonymous with begging, imikuku, poverty, uh, and powerlessness. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. That we are just a group of beggars. So that is the vision we have for our race. You know, in every field, you know, we stand upright, we stand proud, and our children look at us and those who come after us as role models. If you want to be a lawyer, you know, the child thinks a black lawyer. I mean, the example of the dolls that our children play with, you know, the pain that you see that there are children who, when you give them a black doll, you know, but I, I don't want it, it's ugly. You know, they want the Barbie, the white one. We know. Which it's not just a toy. It's part and parcel of our colonization. Colonization. And the movies know? we watch, the dramas exactly. we watch, everything. <laughs> like Les Zindos Abo, you know, I, I remember growing up. Abo Rambo, Sylvester Stallone, and Abo 
Schwarzenegger, now Chuck Norris. It's just America conquering the world. You understand? We, yeah. We were just indoctrinated yeah. with movies that show us that. Utina na uzbizu acha ile inja le urambo ya urambo. Urambo. But some more the enemy back born with this. Ai, ai ba ishaile le ntwa. So that's na bonu be si into ana that time. That part of the work with us so Tina school abantu amehlo ukuthi abantu are in film and in theater. Do productions that portray black people positively and portray them as smart and as productive. Stop perpetuating this thing. I call it a new channel. I don't want to call it, in, you know, a, on TV. You know, there's this channel on TV in Japan by cover. You know, that portrays black people as just stupid, clumsy, disorganized, and bashala belwa. You know, a old television channel that specializes in portraying black people as disorganized, clumsy, broken families, and what what. You know, and I was saying. There are so many black families and black fathers and mothers who are doing amazing work, you know. Why don't we have programs that also portray that? And I'm not saying hide the weaknesses of the black community, but I'm saying why is there such an overemphasis on the negative aspects? You understand? I mean, we are all nine nine, and you know, what is the purpose of Isenzelan is such a program? And is that the only thing we can come up with? We are Jola 99, for instance, you know. And is that what we want to continue, the messages we want to continue sending, you know? How about programs that show people who are doing the work that you are doing, young black boys and girls, are my innovators, as a kasi, who are designing stuff, and we get bombarded with those images, you know? Who are designing stuff? About Salama back room, who are fixing computers? About designer my drones, Emakasi. Where are the stories of those young black boys? The African calendar. Yeah. So, you know, he made a brilliant input, Umkulu, when he was here. Uh, and this is this is part of the work also CNZ when we say Afrocentric. And I think one of the things I thought I would do for us is to also break down this Afrocentric, Afrocentric. Go know? right ahead, yeah. You know, so the concept here, Afrocentricity, if you break down the Afro and the centric. So what, what Afrocentricity means, it means to center African people in everything that we think and do. Which means putting African people at the center of everything that we think and do. So this is what we call Afrocentricity or Afrocentric work, right? So your thinking and your actions are from an Afrocentric perspective. So the work that they do, uh, Omkulu, for instance, is so aligned with the work that we do because they teach a lot, you know. And so when he raised the issue of the African calendar, right, and it is fundamental, one of the things that he wanted us to understand was that um, our very concept of space and time, how we understand space and time, is colonized. That's what he wanted us to understand. So the reason why people develop calendars, right, and calendars are historically developed using the elements of the universe, the stars, the moon, and the movement of all of those elements, right, that's how calendars are developed. Uh, and the ancient Africans actually developed that system, you know, one of them being the lunar system, which has to do with the, uh, the movement of the planets, you know, and that's how seasons, time and everything, and even harvesting was determined. That's how advanced Africans were. Now, when that was even taken away, I mean the current calendar, which we are using, which is called the Gregorian calendar, uh, I mean, the months like July, August, October are named after Roman emperors, Julius Caesar for July, Octavius Caesar for October, Augustus Caesar for August, right? And what that tells you is that even the calendar itself is central, let's say Spanish, to how we are mentally colonized. And when you want to talk decolonization, one of the things you must return to is the African calendar that Umkulu spoke about. Because then all of these other colonial things we have, like Easter and Abo Christmas, which are not our things, right? 
we will then have our own festivals and rituals and holidays if we have to have that that have to do with us we understand i mean there's not a single in the current calendar there's not a single public holiday that has to do with us not one pre-colonial i'm not talking is in after 1994 africans in their original uncontaminated uncolonized form the, this calendar there's not a single thing where we can say there's a day that is dedicated to us. I mean, to give you an example, uh, you, you were saying to me that part of your cultural extraction is that right? one of the great kings, you know, he was not just a king for, you know, with decorations. He fought in liberation wars against the colonizers, right? Where does King Skukuni appear in the calendar? Is there a day, King Skukuni Day? Aiku. You know, um, there are many others. Me na lang suga kona yabona echalishewe where I grew up. Um, so the the colonialists misnamed that place and they called it Kimberley. After Lord Kimberley, who was a British secretary for colonies. But it was part and parcel of the colonial project because they had an interest in the mineral resources there, diamonds. Now many people don't know that one of the kings that fought against them, Posim Pulokeng Janki, was a diamond trader long before the so-called diamonds were discovered. Right? Discovered. You understand? <laughs> so-called discovered. This man was not just a king, he was a diamond trader. Who's related to Kosi Khalishewe, after whom Ikasilam is named. You understand? Now, where are they in the calendar that we have today? There's no Kosi Skukuni day, Kosi Khalishewe day, there is no Kosi Mpulokeng Janki day. None of it. Now, that is how important the issue of the African calendar is because it, just does, it does not just give us a proper sense of space and time but it also helps to connect us with our heritage because it gives us certain days, certain periods where we must do certain things, where we must remember certain things that have to do with us. So it's some education that we must do because it's part and parcel of the whole decolonization project. So we literally have to decolonize everything. And look, decolonizer simply means to reclaim everything that's ours. Reclaiming, he continued and he met with us with Peño. Yeah. He's serious about wanting to start that celebratory uh, day. Calendar, starting. yeah. He says, Boo, even if we're in the it's not going to be September. Yeah, so, when, the, when the year actually starts in terms of our calendar. Yes, that's yeah. what he says. Yeah. The day before May 22. Yeah. What they would call now the uh, Adam's calendar in Pumalang. Yeah. So there's a lot of education that still needs to happen. And I appreciate the fact that you love writing and you yeah. love reading. And there's so much that we did not even touch on. For instance, why they call you the essayist or why you call yourself <laughs> the essayist. Yeah. You were sharing with me even off air that you just love writing essays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was, I was talking with Ngoskazi about this in anticipation of the interview. You know, yeah. this essay is thing. This is, it comes from high school. Okay. So, I mean, I scale, uh, I would always ask for extra paper during my exams or tests. Yeah, well, because I loved essay questions. Yeah, well, I excelled at, at, at essay. So about essay questions. Yeah, well, I mean, about discuss, uh, elaborate. Hey, you taking me home, Baba. My house is, yeah, well. So I would always ask for extra paper as well. Yeah. You know, uh, or even extra 20 minutes. Or remember, extra 20 minutes. Yeah, well, yeah. Because I loved discussing and being turned to scrape at an early age. You understand? So any time I planted that seed because during the 80s, I was in the city press every Sunday. At the time I was in local link, I was in the city press. City press. He used to have that ritual. I was in the city press. I was in the city press. So one day, at the time I was trap, after I was in the city press, he asked me, what are they saying in that section? He said, I was in the city press. And then I noticed next, next Sunday, 
I'm gonna show him he's a phone. So next Sunday Wang Nigeza is section. First section Wang Nigeza and I read it. Second section I read it. Yeah, no piece of funding section. But saying Buzuguti, what are they saying there? Hang chel. This is what they're saying. Now the beauty about it is that Mini Time Alam, according to colonial standards, he was a standard six guy. But that timer produced this essayist because he's the one who planted the seed. Uguting is a and be invited by people like yourself who recognize the little work that we are doing. You understand? And again, this is why I was saying to you, it is important that we are clear by whose standards are we judging our abilities. You know, because that's one of the major things that leads to eat depression and we think we are failures as Abandaba Myama because we judge ourselves by standards that were determined externally by other people mm. and not our own standards. And it is the most fundamental thing that I try to do in the work that I teach and I write. Because I said to people, I don't need to be a doctor or a professor to teach and write about African history. Because I am an African. Right, that history should flow through my veins. Like just watching Mkulu Credo Mutu's oh. videos here. On oh, yeah, his, just videos on their own. Exactly. Just him speaking. Yeah. I would like I don't mind watching Mkulu speak for two hours. Exactly. I and then I repeat it and I watch. And then I even other people even get bored. They just watch for five minutes yeah. like I when an alum kulu aku credo muto. Yeah. I'm but like, when hey, are you, when it's are not you just taking, Mkulu, yeah. like, And then if I remember you know, a person who got me to Ukoko Credo Muto may so rest in peace in case I mean Klungo Guti. I was never awake at that time. And when Saspana no Urut Boy Paul, I was from Umvulan. Umvulan was so close to Mkul. Umvulan used to go to Mkul Plaza, you yeah. know. And Umvulan had such a good relationship with Mkul that in Kiza, I mean, from go to Mkul, they were shown and I was in But luckily, at least Mkul was recorded, saying a lot of things that we can learn from. So see about Mkul and Mkul. Yeah. And before I let you go. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask you one more. Is there a reason why you always mention the time? Uh, uh, you don't mention already that yeah. much. Is that is there a reason? Their conscious decision, maybe. I don't no, know. No, no, no. It's just yeah. a questioning, yeah, Bona, yeah, yeah. Because, oh, okay. Because uh, maybe on this interview you spoke no, no, no. more about the time. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Definitely not. Because the thing is also you would need another two hours if Singa Kulmanga already. Because in terms of my development and my makeup, they made distinct contributions. He only did a time, and I always try to to honor each of them in their own space of time because they've made such significant contributions. Yeah, boy. So he only did as well equally. Uh, we would need another two hours in Jenge Chelenge already, except to tell you that um, I th my emotional intelligence, right, is credit to he only did. As in his into ngati time, my time, but my emotional intelligence. And this thing of believing in affirming another person and always trying to convey positive words and uh, messages to another person, that is my mother's teaching. So I may not have mentioned the Ole Dilam, but the gifts that I brought you, no mkulu o umlocho, you know, something that I was taught by my mother. Mm, we no, am told. I get it. No, yeah. I get it. So all I'm saying to you is that yes, I did not mention it all lady, but uh, if you look at my attributes and my personality makeup, you all lady the appeal. Oh I know yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> yeah the appeal, the no, we'd love to have you back and we're oh, looking yeah. forward to visiting you guys. Yeah. We love what you're doing. Yeah, and thank you. Bong Emi Naman. And uh, I love the the the, the the connection, I don't want to call it a coincidence. Oh, okay. Yeah, there are, <laughs> yeah as he said, it's a coincidence. The coffee colors. <laughs> so, Amanyang, uh, Yabo, uh, Abandaba uh, Kulu, whispered in my ear and in your ear, Uguti, when we converge today, we are going to converge on the basis of these Gavi colors. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, yeah. And guys, it's not like we spoke. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what he was going to wear. Yeah. I, didn't, I just put on this t shirt yeah. today, but exactly as he's saying. About pants who were like, hey. Yeah, they, they conspired. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, more fire. Guys, we're on a, uh, I don't want to say a war, yeah. but I love this awakening that is happening all over the world. Yeah. And uh, from time to time, as much as this platform is educational, you guys know, but educational in all aspects. It can't just be only in entrepreneurship. As you guys have heard, 
umkhulu phela we don't just bring abantu bazosifundisa labo say ikhohla le yomfundo bahamba nayo no that's why every other interview after that you'll keep on hearing me referencing other interviews that we've had before it shows mm. that we remember what was said in certain interviews and that we practice so we are starting to practice some of those teachings certain things we take certain things we take to go um but in interrogate them and research yeah. them some more so we know more but we are learning it's a long journey it's a lifelong journey to learn but i'm excited that it's today we got this two hours no book really. and then uh, just as we close it i'd like for you to recommend some books for some of our people out there especially the younger ones yeah who would like to start getting introduced into these uh black consciousness teachings teachings or yeah. let me just say um african teachings i saw i saw yeah so i've got two books with me here right uh, the two books Abu Baba Babili, who were central to the founding of the African National Congress Youth League. Yabona. So the first book is Anton Lembede, Freedom in Our Lifetime. Right? So I made the point earlier, if you want to understand the radical thinking, the source is actually this man. Mm. Yeah, well, the source is actually this Anton man. Anton Lembed. Ubabu ya umuzi wa ke Lembed. You know? Throughout the ages, man has fought and struggled to free himself from one kind of yeah. serf, serfdom or another. This history is well known. It is the story of Europe after French Revolution of England after 1215, of South Africa after 1833 mm. of Russia, after 1917 of India, Egypt and Indonesia today. This is a quote from Anton Lembede, the first ANC Youth League president. Mm. Yeah. But when a, when a group of young political activists met in 19, 1944 uh -huh. to launch the ANC Youth League, it included the nucleus of a remarkable generation of leaders, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Altasi Sulu, Jordan Gubane, Ellen Kuzal, Albertina Sisulu, A.P. Mda, Dan Tlome, and David Bupape. Yeah. It was Anton Lembede, however, whom they chose as their first president. Lembede was known for his sharp intellect, fiery personality, and unwavering commitment to the struggle at hand. The son of a farm laborer, Lembede had worked tirelessly to put himself through school and then qualify as a lawyer. In untim his untimely death in 1947, Ubabu Lembede died at the age of 33 as well. Having, a, having, a, having a master's degree, and he was about to enroll for a doctorate. At 33? At 33. He sent a wave of grief through the Congress youth who had looked to him for moral and well as political leadership. Freedom in Our Lifetime acknowledges Lembede's early contribution to the freedom movement, in particular his passionate and eloquent articulation of the African-centered philosophy he called Africanism. Yeah. Anton Lembede, Freedom in Our Lifetime. Thank you. So that's yeah. one um, recommendation. recommendation. Yeah. Okay. And then his companion, actually. So the guy he used to debate with, yeah, well, who succeeded him after his untimely death as president of the ANC Youth League? Ubaba Usolom Zimta. They call him Apimta. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, we uh, had to Prazix here the other day. Yeah. You know? Oh, wow. It's time like you can do Apimta. Okay. Yeah, so, Ubaba Apimta says something interesting. Before Ulempede goes and presents an idea, yeah, I test a guy through a debate to check whether his argument was uh, potent. Wow. Yeah. So these are the two great men um, that I wish to recommend that our young people must read. You know. Um, so guys, let me just quickly go through this one at the back. You can do it at your own time, but maybe some of you guys who are lazy to the class of 1944, the founders of the African National Congress Youth League, includes a remarkable list of names, Nelson Mandela, Alta Sisulu, Oliver Tambo, Anton Lembede, and Ashby Peter, AP Mda. While much has been written on the others, relatively little attention has been paid to Mda, the Youth League president from 1947 to 1949 whom his peers regarded as the foremost intellectual and strategist of their generation. He was known for his passionate advocacy of African nationalism, guiding the ANC into militant forms of protest and pressing activists to consider turning to armed struggle in the early 1950s. In his late teens, Mda began leaving a rich written record through letters and essays in newspapers, political tracts and speeches and letters to colleagues that allows us to chart the evolution of his views throughout his life. 
not only on politics but also on culture, language, literature, music, religion, and education. Also, Prasik Simda, this is where it comes the from. Seed. That's That's right. The seed. Lendomen seed, yeah. The seed. It's yes. very important which we must plant the seed. Because we then understand Aknamo coincidences. Plant the seed. And Afrocentricity teaches us that everything is connected. The European looks at human beings and the world as disconnected. That's why they lack so much confession. For us, everything is connected. Your success and my success is interconnected. Your downfall and my downfall interconnected. That's Afrocentricity. But, but Valim, uh, before you go, but Valim, eh? yeah. I would like for you to just say your last words to our audiences out there, although you're still coming back. But just to wrap <laughs> it up, just to do we vibe. Yeah. Well, um... <laughs> There was a video that I, I was trying to do on social media. I know, media. like, come on. Well, um. Oh, well, uh, well, uh, well. Uh. Are you well? Uh. Are you well? Well, um. <laughs> they say politicians before uh, they lie. Well, uh. Are you well? Uh. Are you well? Uh, uh, really, uh, so, no, I'm going to mean, Anje, Spoon Fetch, so the first thing where I must start is may this platform outlive you. Yeah, boy. Mm. May this platform outlive you. Um, so that this platform becomes a monument. Right. It, be, it should outlive you, and we will do our best to support your work because we see your vision for our race as black people. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is um, it is important that. We must develop a culture as black people, especially like South Africa, a culture of lifting each other up. And we don't always have to necessarily give each other something in material form. But let's develop a culture where we affirm each other with positive words. It starts there, you know. So you don't always have to give people money and resources or other material things. But one of the things I wish for us as black people to develop and internalize is a culture of saying, congratulations, you are doing good work. I admire what you are doing. I would like to work with you. I would like to invite you. Please support his product. Please buy his book. Please go and attend his meeting. You know, I would like for us to develop that culture, you know, and of just helping each other rise and lifting it. You know, do away with the negative competition and uh, you know. And most importantly also, especially Tina Machita, um, let's work on this thing of the violence, right, that we are dishing out against black sisters. And also the violence that we are dishing out as Amajita against each other. Because one of the big tragedies in a country is that the majority of the people who commit the crime of murder and the people who get murdered are young black men, you know. And part of the work as Yenzayo, as part of this Black Brothers United project, has to do with us trying to develop positive character amongst young black men so in spite of our circumstances yes but we must still try to be and especially especially tina's pattern so that's really the type of message i would want to leave us with you know so sure. well known african essayist Put Velim Pele, Amako put. Amako put. As long as you have put. We're looking forward to having you back here again. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. If you've forgotten to click the like button, please click it. Don't forget to click the subscription, especially. That's the most important one because this community has to grow and we've been growing like crazy. Thank you very much for tuning in, guys. We'll see you on the next video. This is The Hustlers Corner.